All right, laminate flooring. Definitely a very popular type of flooring for installations these days, especially for a DIYer, beginner, or somebody who's just trying to sell their home or make their home look nice. This stuff is really DIY friendly as far as installation. I'm gonna give you a bunch of tips on how to go about installing this and some things to prevent you from having, uh, making some big mistakes. And then also a few things that are gonna save you some money. So be sure to watch all the way through the video because each tip is really gonna make it more efficient for you installing this product. All right, so first thing, the basic tools. Now I'm gonna show you the basic tools of all it takes to install this. Um, now there's gonna be some tools that I'm gonna be using throughout this project that are gonna make it a little bit easier. And if you're a contractor trying to do this as a service, I recommend you buy all of these tools because it's gonna make it a lot more efficient and quick for you to install. But the basics are essentially just a beading block and there's two different kinds. There's kind of a, a cheap version. Uh, you can get them in a kit um, and they work just fine. Both of them, all they're doing is literally hitting the block to put them in places. But I kind of like the solid built um, beaters. They just seem to have a little bit more durability and be able to put in things into place. The next is basically a glorified crowbar. But what's important about this is this allows you to get into the edges of your room and click it into, into place. So it's kind of like a crowbar, but it has a little smaller fin that allows you to grab things. This is really important for the last row of the installation. Um, another thing I commonly use is just a big crowbar. This is to get, remove the carpet along with a floor scraper for removing those staples. So if you have carpet, these two tools are gonna definitely help out because you need to get all the tack strips out and all the staples out as well. The other is, I would say it's pretty important, especially for going around doorways and areas where you need to undercut trim and that is using an oscillating tool. I'm gonna to show you a better tool a little bit later on in the video that actually makes it a little bit quicker and more efficient. And then just a standard circular saw. Um, that's just gonna be allow you to rip things down, cut them, cut the pieces, so you don't necessarily need a trim saw or anything else like that. Now I am gonna be using a, a six foot level or a straight edge to evaluate my floor. That's really important before you get started. Preparation is key for the, a good sound installation. So let's get through a couple of those tips first. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is evaluate your floor surface. So any loose boards, anything that might be moving, um, you definitely wanna make sure your subfloor is sound. If you have any squeaking in areas, make sure you screw that subfloor into place. Now this is an old home. This is like built in the 1900s. So we got this old Douglas fir um, hardwood floor. It's not hardwood, it's basically a pine uh, flooring. They use this really underneath as a subfloor rather than um, plywood. They used to use tongue and groove product like this. So this um, has its own challenges. Uh, there's probably gonna be areas that are deteriorated that you're gonna have to patch. But the most important thing going over something like this in an older home is making sure that your surface is flat. So the rule of thumb on Pergo is 3 16 inch difference in flatness over 10 foot. So I don't have a 10 foot straight edge. I'm just gonna use my six foot. So basically anything within an eighth of an inch over six foot, I would wanna address. Now, how do you go about dressing that one? You can shave down the areas that might be a little bit higher Floor leveler might be the key to be able to get everything flat um, or just removing sections of this to get it to be even. You just don't want to have a big dip anywhere because the floor doesn't do well with that. There's no, it's not being fastened in any way, so it's kind of floating. And if you ever were in a room with this stuff where there is a dip, it kind of pushes air out of the room and it's just kind of like a floating it, does, it doesn't feel right. It's just like you're moving as you're walking through the room. So it needs to be flat. So I'm just gonna evaluate everything, make sure that nothing's rocking. I'm not necessarily worried about levelness, but I did notice over here that I do have a hump. So I need to address this board so you can see. <laughs> I mean, that's like, I don't even know, a half inch out. So I got two boards here that are kind of beveled out. So what I wanna do is either replace this section or what I think I'm gonna do is just cut right down the center here. Maybe that'll give a little bit of a relief cut. So let's address that first. Oh, 
there must be you know what I think it is I think it's the it's basically this bay window kind of dipping down I bet probably it's probably sinking a little bit and it raised these this area right here so I think what I'll do is put some 5 8 inch plywood in here so it's a little bit lower and then if I have to floor patch it I will yeah so when I have this across here it is even I mean there might be an eighth inch here in the back so I just need to literally make this smaller within this area so let me see what this is six and a quarter six and a half okay so that's much much more flat I still got an eighth inch here because it's still dropping down over that way, but it's within an eighth inch, so it'll be fine. So it's not gonna hump over too much. Okay, so holes like this, I always have a roll of aluminum. Um, rather than taking the time to actually cut from each joist to joist, you could just simply put this over here just to keep any deflect or any deflection in between that hole, but that's not a very big size hole. So I'm just gonna use some nails to go over that area. So I have a little bit of a loose board here, so you don't want any type of movement like that. So let's just put a screw into our joist. Okay, so I always like to cut all my, make all the mess at the beginning, you know, cut all your jams, make sure all the floors level, do whatever you have to do to get everything to slide underneath. Because once you start getting into this, you can get into a flow state and really run a lot of planking but if you have to stop every few minutes to try to uh, go around things or cut things like this it just takes a longer time so first way i'm going to do it is just do the minimal way just using an oscillating tool works terrific it's just that if you have a lot of doorways you're probably going to eat up some blades and it might take you know it just does take a little bit longer but let me demonstrate that so i just have a, a strap piece here so i just want to cut my jam so that this can slide underneath of that area So works perfectly, definitely an awesome way to go about it. Um, but the other option is to use a toe kick saw. So this is kind of like a big grinder, but what it has is an adjustability to it that allows me to adjust it to the height of what my flooring is. You'll see a lot of guys using this for hardwood flooring. When you're going around all these different areas, it's gonna be a lot faster uh, because it's already set at the right depth and you can just go right through the bottom of the jam So one nice thing about this is that there if you have a shop vac that has a plug port When you use the tool, it'll turn on the shop vac and take out some of the dust So this is really helpful uh, on on just about every type of tool. So I'm just gonna plug in my toe kick saw click it to the plug and then I'm gonna attach my port into the end of the toe kick. So fireplaces, this is a place you could save a little bit of money. So you could always buy some quarter round and then go up against the fireplace. A little difficult with some uneven stone. Um, and plus, I mean, I wouldn't be using the white. This is gonna match our trim, but I'd most likely be getting a stained oak trim if I were to go around the fireplace. So rather than spending like $70 worth of uh, trim to do this, and plus this is all uneven anyways, so it's gonna be kind of problematic to get that trim to sit nicely. What I'm gonna do is just use my grinder with a diamond grinder bit and undercut all of my stone all the way around so that my planks can slide underneath of there. And 
this will provide a good one inch curb cut. So you'll have that expansion and contraction that you're needing at the fireplace as well. So I didn't say it was easier. <laughs> it's just gonna work out a lot better. So having it all cut will make that all look really natural and I don't have to have any trim up against my stone. So areas that you need to fill in that you're not gonna be able to necessarily cut out the wood and, and reposition it. I would use something like this. This is a Ardex feather finish. It's basically a patching material. And what's great about this is that you don't have to prime the surface that you're actually patching and it takes about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to set up and you can put your flooring over it. But I always have a bag of this on hand for anything that has a major depression or gaps like that. Now, I have about a three quarter, well, almost about an inch and a half gap here between my uh, subfloor and the brick. So I'm gonna use this Ardex feather finish, really easy instructions, basically two parts powder, one part water, so whatever ratio you want to mix it, it's fine. I mean, as far as the, uh, the quantity, but I'm just going to mix up like a quart of this. And you can use this in any of the gaps. I mean, even if you wanted to fill in this gap, you can use it for that. Not that that's really necessary. Okay, so let me just go ahead and fill in that area. And again, what's really helpful with this stuff is if you have a big depression somewhere, you can actually float this out. I mean, using a wider trowel of some sort, but you can almost make it use it as floor leveler in some areas. So if you have a major depression somewhere, this would be a good product for that. So even something like this, I can just fill in with that floor patch and get that to be even. And what's great is that it'll it only take about 20 minutes and I can start I can go over it with the flooring. Okay, so even before you get started, even planning a week ahead of time, make sure you get the product on the site of where you're going to be installing this cuz humidity levels really make a difference with this stuff. So, you know, if your home is the same as the building that this is stored, you can go ahead and immediately install it, but I would recommend at least having 3 days of time for this to sit in place. So what I have here, I just kind of crisscross them. I put some boards in between so that there's enough airflow to go through the entire package. Cause this is really gonna make a difference as far as the way it behaves with the expansion contraction. And also with acclimation, you have to determine the humidity of the place that you're putting it in. So there are some areas that this would not be a good product to go over and that would be anywhere that there is a moisture issue. So if you have a basement that has a lot of leakage, I would probably not recommend laminate flooring because the humidity level coming up through is going to make this expand and swell and do abnormal things. But one way to test that is just a simple uh, sensor. So these have little spikes on them. You just inject it into the wood and it'll give a reading. You want to be below 12% or at 8.5%. 5%, so we're right in that range area. But this is really important whether you're doing hardwood, laminate, anything like that, because the humidity and the, and the, the amount of moisture in your subfloor is gonna affect how your floor behaves. So if you do this stuff all the time, it's a good idea to get a blade that's specifically for laminate. Because um, this laminate actually is pretty hardy stuff. And your regular trim saw blades, will end up dulling really quickly. So I would recommend getting a laminate blade. I mean, these things are pretty expensive, so you would have to be doing more than just one job, but it will really make a difference and last a lot longer and make some nicer cuts. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this out. Okay, then I would plug this into my shop vac. This dust is also really fine and really horrible. So put this on a shop vac 
eliminate that dust from flying everywhere. Hopefully your room is a little bit more straightforward in this particular situation. This is a quite a complicated um, situation because we basically have a bump out window here, fireplace on the other side of the, the room, and there really isn't any real straight part of anything here. So we're gonna have to basically reference what was already existing here, which is this old hardwood floor. Um, they ran everything perpendicular to the joists, and that would be the same thing that you would wanna do with the laminate. So if your joists are running this way, you wanna go the opposite direction with your laminate. Most of the time that works out pretty well because you know your longer part of your room, you wanna have that, that plank going with the room. Now it doesn't always work that way, but a rule of thumb is really best to have it perpendicular to those joists. So we're really, since there isn't, I mean, this is an old home, 1900s, nothing's square about it, nothing's gonna measure out evenly, and it could take me forever to try to figure out what's square. I even have a bump out for a fireplace that goes all the way through the, the roof. This is an old chimney where everything's vented through. And uh, so there really is no reference of square. So we're gonna go off of these existing planks. We're just gonna go straight down the center and just give myself a reference point so that we're at least all straight in the line from one side of the room to the other. So I'm just gonna pick a random plank here somewhere in the middle and we're just gonna go right to the center of this so that we can put a chalk line. So that line is gonna help us be able to get the first cuts on that first row so that we can come out. Okay, so you want a vapor barrier, and this is gonna be for most of your laminate floorings. Some of them have it integrated with it, uh, but a lot of them, I mean, even if they were integrated, it's not a bad idea to have this as extra cushion. Uh, this does give us a feel, it gives a little bit more of a softness to it, but the most important thing is that it's eliminating any vapor or moisture coming up from underneath. This is even more important over concrete. So if you're over concrete, you really don't wanna skip this. I know this is just like an added expense to the whole project, but vapor barriers are important to eliminate that moisture from coming through. So this basically has a double-sided tape type of situation on this that will continue to keep that vapor barrier continuous. So starting out, you have to put that on the, the back side because then once you overlay the next piece, you can adhere it to it. Yeah. That should work out well. So here's a big piece of advice. They make all these clips and all these special things to be able to provide gaps. And I found over the years of doing this stuff that just having a block up against the wall ends up bouncing off of you and causing problems. So my recommendation is just to simply drill a hole through the laminate and put a screw into your subfloor so that that can basically make sure that this doesn't move and then you will just remove the screws and potentially, you know, just put some wood filler in that hole or if you have it close enough to the wall, you know, your trim is just gonna cover it. Now we're using three quarter inch trim here. I would recommend a three quarter inch trim because a lot of the um, shoe moldings and stuff like that aren't gonna be thick enough to go overcome three eighths of an inch. So if you go with a three quarter inch, um, quarter round, you'll be in good shape. So I'm just gonna drill through the, in the corner of my laminate and put some screws in it to actually hold it in place. This is just the easiest way that I've found just because when you're trying to rely off of blocks that hold it into place, all it does is bounce and cause a lot of problems. 
So that's one thing I've learned over the years is that if you can get this board to be sitting nicely and uh, soundly, it's just gonna make the whole installation a heck of a lot easier. Okay, so now that's gonna hold that into place. We already referenced our chalk line, so now we know that we're kind of straight here for the most part. Now we can go ahead and work our way to the, the corner here. Let's just make another cut. Again, you wanna just be 12 inches away from your center, so just make sure that you're not staggering this too closely to that. So around 32 inches for our next cut. Okay, so when you join two pieces together, just get this over top of your tongue. So this is where the block comes into play. Okay, so that makes it all nice and tight. See, that's where having these screws in here, if you just had a block in there, when I'm trying to force this over, all this is gonna do is bounce off of that trim and it's gonna make it much tougher to get this all nice and tight. So now that you have all your seams tight, now we can measure for this piece here. So jigsaw, very, very helpful. I would just advise getting uh, blades for laminate. Uh, again, just gonna last a lot longer than a normal bit. And they do sell them specifically for laminate. Best way to go about this is to slide this into the back panel, align it with your edge piece here. Put some pressure on the back. Like I always use my knee pad on the back here. And then just take your block and beat it into place. And then just pay attention to make sure that everything's tight. And then you just move right on to the next piece. This little tongue here, just have right resting on the side of the other piece or just, just close to it. it, doesn't have to be perfect but you just don't want to smash that tongue off. So get the back all nice and tight and then take your block and then pound it into place where it's all nice and tight. Doesn't hurt to reference your line again. So we got 41 and an eighth, 41 and an eighth. We're good on our line. So now we're all nice and straight. One other thing I wanna mention about the layout, because I see this a lot online, especially YouTubers, and that is uh, called staircasing. So staircasing is basically starting out say with a full piece and in every, so in this instance, you don't want to have it more than uh, less than 12 inches from the edge, but there's a lot of other laminates that say six inches. So what I see a lot is they'll just run a whole bunch of rows, six to 12 inches apart from each other all the way along the whole room. You don't want to do that because you're basically having all the diagonals, all those um, offsets, all kind of, somewhat in a diagonal fashion, all in a line with each other. And what will, that will do is it'll, allow it to, it'll move in irregular ways. So you want to avoid that, and you also want to avoid half patterns or predictable patterns. Um, primarily half patterns. You wouldn't want to, they call that an H pattern, essentially just having two pieces like this and you stagger them all the way across. So this one matches this one on every other one. Again, it's gonna irregularly move in that fashion. So my suggestion is just to do two rows at a time and then offset 
your joints randomly. You just wanna stagger them and just avoid that continuous diagonal pattern of breakage. So if you do two rows at a time, you probably won't have that issue and you certainly don't wanna be lining things up with each other just as long as they're offset for the most part. So starting out with our next row, uh, we had a 14 inch piece here, this is 36. Yeah, we'll go out with 24, you wanna be 12 inches away from your following piece. Okay, so now to figure out what you need to start out with, everything revolves around what we have existing here. So let's just go ahead and put some pieces together. Really the easiest way to do this is just to put these together and figure out what that width is gonna be. So I just got some scrap pieces here. Looks like basically a seven inch piece. I got lucky here. I was able to slide this underneath this jam, but if you were halfway through basically your area, you're not gonna be able to do that. So I got lucky here. So if you didn't, I would just recommend making your seam at the doorway so you can cut the L shape or cut out the notch to go around it. But in this case, I'm able to slide it right through that trim. Okay, so now we got the floor done. We're gonna go ahead and take our spacers out, take all our screws out that we put in here temporarily. Okay, then anywhere that you 
have everything pressed up tight. Take your oscillating tool and cut back the flooring. Try to keep that 3 8 inch reveal along the edge here. Okay, then other, one other quick tip. If you have a lot of other construction going on, um, it's not a bad idea to put some backer rod in between the joint and the wall. This will just ensure that you maintain that gap and not get any debris or anything in it. So this is kind of an extra little step. And if you had baseboard that is up above the main floor, then it's not going to work because it'll just kind of sink behind it. But in this instance, I have my base trim that goes all the way down that original subfloor. So now I can just go ahead and put this backer rod in here and this will maintain that space. Okay, so for the quarter round, I'm gonna be using a cordless nailer. This is really helpful, makes it a lot easier than we're gonna to have to drag the air hose around. Um, but I would recommend the 18 gauge nails. We're gonna use some two inch nails. Biggest thing about installing quarter round is make sure you're not penetrating the actual laminate. So make sure that you're at an angle that it's not actually hitting the, the laminate flooring. Again, this stuff needs to move. Definitely makes a big difference between winter and summer. It just has to move in order for it to stay in good shape. So avoid nailing into the laminate. And I'm gonna be doing the regular full three quarter inch, uh, basically quarter round here. And since everything is so unsquare and nothing is even, I'm gonna actually cope the corners. Makes it a lot easier in these older homes rather than trying to cut a 45 and make that look neat. If you cope, you can't go wrong. It always looks good. So I'm gonna put my first piece on here. The other thing I'm gonna do on each edge is just basically quarter, you know, make a, a corner, a nice edge on my corner here. So returning my 45. So you're gonna to need to make a lot of little precise cuts to make this look good. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's just a matter of paying attention. Normally I use uh, a latex caulking I like to use the quick dry stuff because I want to be able to caulk this and get it painted today. So um, put a little bit of, it, uh, of the caulking on these little pieces here before you set them in place. And then just make sure that you're nailing towards the wall and not down into the floor. So then we'll just measure right to the bottom of my quarter round. So you got like 31 and a half. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is cut my coping side. So you just need a 45 degree angle on your trim. So this is the side that goes into the corner. We cut everything along the edge of that painted line. You're basically just back cutting the entire corner off when I bring it into that corner. So make the regular cut, back cut it with the coping saw, and then you'll have a nice corner. All right, so nothing fun about a one inch transition. So this is basically one inch off of my laminate flooring. Basically I had a half inch plywood, I had an uncoupling membrane, and then I actually had the thick slate tile. So I ended up with an inch overhang. So what I'm gonna, what I did was basically modified a transition strip here. 
So as you can see, this is made for two different levels of flooring. So basically like a three quarter inch flooring and then your, your laminate flooring. So the laminate is only about three eighths of an inch thick. So I cut one of these tabs off of the ends and basically this is just gonna go right over top of the edge of my tile and go right on the edge. So that works out well. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sink nails diagonally into the plywood. But I also think it's a good idea to put some clear silicone on the outside edge. This is just kind of helps secure it a little bit and adheres it to the laminate flooring. Biggest thing is, is you don't want to be putting any nails into the laminate flooring that needs room to breathe. So let's just go ahead and put this like so. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do with a one inch transition other than something like this. The only other alternative I had would be to raise this outside floor, like put half inch plywood down there, but that was going to be a lot more expense than what I wanted to get into. So same thing here, about one inch, that dreaded one inch. So at the doorway, you have to keep that reveal up against your door. So keep that 3 8 inch reveal on your laminate flooring. So all I'm gonna do is use a piece of quarter round and then just nail at a diagonal into the subflooring below. But I'm gonna put a little bit of silicone on the bottom edge here because that'll help just kind of secure it into place. Um, because obviously this is an exterior door, so there's a lot of movement here and a lot of expansion contraction just because of the cold weather. So just put that here and then just make sure that you're not hitting the laminate but going diagonally into the subfloor below. But that's a really important area to keep movement, being able to have, uh, have that movement in there. So wow, what a big difference having this floor down and there's a reason why Pergo is still one of the original laminates out there that is really uh, highly popular because this stuff you can't even barely tell that it's not hardwood i mean they really have done a great job of matching this up looks tremendous so if you pay attention to a couple of the details that we did throughout this video one was undercutting our fireplace that gives a real nice natural look to our um, stone area here uh, we obviously did the, the quarter round around everywhere to cover up that three eighths inch gap which came out well and then we had our transitions into our floor. So a couple of things I probably could have done a little bit better if I would have planned ahead and spent a little bit of extra money. One was how much higher my floors to my kitchen and to my bathroom was. We basically had about an inch and a quarter difference before the laminate. And so we had basically a one inch transition coming into here. What I could have done is done a, a layer of half inch plywood or it's even three quarter inch plywood throughout this entire area and got this nice and even. But you know, these transitions work well. It's just one inch is always can be sometimes uh, a tripping hazard depending you know, on, on how bad it is. So that's one thing I could have definitely done a little bit better with. Um, other than that, I mean, this really turned out tremendous. It really flows really nicely and everything lined up really nicely with uh, the squareness or the unsquareness of this entire floor plan. Just a lot of cuts, a lot of areas that you had to, um, you know, basically navigate the laminate underneath of. Yeah, you got, I'm, I'm, <laughs> all right, so let's go over some laminate tips. It started over again, so I 